Hello and welcome again to Off the Cast, the audio podcast channel dedicated to ophthalmology. We are a team at Off the Cast who strive to provide you with latest audio talks on ophthalmology which are more practical and easy to understand, targeted at students and residents alike. These audios are in no way a replacement to your standard textbooks. We strive to be factually correct, but to err is human. Keep us posted if you disagree with anything that has been said in these recordings. We would be happy to make amendments with due credits. Today we are feeling a bit different. So instead of giving you a full talk on a single topic, we are going to give you a mixed bag. Today we will discuss a bit of history, one short topic and one clinical sign, all related to each other. So let's begin. You must have heard of Mark Amsler, a young German ophthalmologist of early 1990s. What does Dr. Mark Amsler, Dr. Jules Gornin and Edmund Landolt have in common, other than being European origin and old pioneers? Let's listen, learn and understand their contributions and involvements with ophthalmology. Dr. Mark Amsler was born in 1891 in Swiss. He was a student of Dr. Jules Gornon, the great retina legend who gave us Igni puncture. Igni puncture was the first known treatments for retinal detachments. At the University of Lausanne, Dr. Gornon and Dr. Amsler together developed the ideas of Gornon further. Mark Amsler succeeded Gornon as Chair of Ophthalmology at Lausanne. He was also the Professor at University of Zurich. The interests of Mark Amsler in his independent times stretched from aqueous humour to the macula. He pioneered in the study of aqueous humour in uveitis. With the background of retina from his teacher, he craved to develop a better test for macular function. Dr. Edmund Landolt, the C optotype man from Switzerland, was already working his way up with perimetry and igneous modifications. He used to place a grid card at the center of his perimeter. He never explained it or took it ahead. Then young Amsler built upon this idea. Till then, there were various techniques to chart scotomas, but none for metamorphopsia. Metamorphopsia till then used to be worked up with moving tiny test objects through stereoscopes. These could not document metamorphopsia but the patient could perceive. I can't figure out how they did it but sure it is a torment. Amsler got this idea from the cards that Edmund Landolt used and designed a prototype of the current what we call as the Amsler's grid. Amsler's twist to the card was to take it out of the perimeter and use it independently to test only for the macula. Maybe that the previous users tried to map the entire retina for metamorphopsia at the same time instead of focusing on the macula. Amsler experimented extensively with different patterns and different colors of the grid design. Mark Amsler was the first to draw attention to the possibility of this test but still today, fortunately, has kept its value in a wonderful way. Additionally, he also contributed to the progress in understanding of uveitis, especially the changes inside the aqueous humor. His contributions to keratoconus and keratoplasty is well known. The first keratoplasty in his country was through his hands. Now, what is Amsler's grid and how does it work? Amsler's grid is a printed sheet of paper on which there are a series of perpendicularly intersecting vertical and horizontal lines, like a graph paper. Now how does it work? Follow me as I speak. Take your handheld direct ophthalmoscope. Look for the fixation filter. It is also known as a grid in some models. It gives a spot of light with lines or markings radially. Point the light to the wall not more than half a meter away. You get perfectly straight lines and markings on the wall. Now put it on a curtain in your room. The image will get distorted as per the undulations in the curtain. 
Then take a glass slide, put a drop of oil on it and project the light on the wall through this slide. This is where it gets interesting. This is how one of the ways a patient with macular edema looks at the Amsler's grid. The Amsler's grid is used to detect central vision defects or distortions. The cause of this type of defect or distortion is usually a result of macular dysfunctions such as macular degeneration or retinal problems. Defects may also be attributed to advanced glaucoma or neurological problems. The optics of the Amsler's grid works the same way as a screen. A movie is best seen on a flat screen. When we say flat, it actually means all the points on the screen are equidistant from the point of projection. That's when a football in the center of the field and periphery looks the same size and shape. This is where the wave front comes in. Wave front is the collection of all the corresponding points in a beam of light. There is an incident wave front, which is a set of rays coming from a source of light or object. Imagine this wave front as a large cloth spread out. This wave front has to hit a screen of the same contour to create an image without any aberration. If the wave front or the screen is deformed at any stage, the image gets deformed. As you had seen in the experiment, the image was deformed with the glass with oil and also the curtain. Because any of these problems will decrease or increase the effective distance travelled by a set of rays among the wave fronts leading to a clumping or separation of rays. A closer screen tends to give a smaller image. A steep screen gives a stretched image. A distant screen gives a stretched image but not as much as an oblique screen. And finally, a screen pulled from all sides gives clumped image in the centre and stretched image at the boundary of the pull. These configurations have to do with the fact that although the spatial arrangement of the screen, that is, the layer of rods and cones have changed in the retina, but the occipital cortex in the brain doesn't know it yet. All these distances that I mentioned about are measured from the principal point of the crystalline lens. Now, what happens in macular edema of any cause? Let's have a look into it. Whatever the cause may be in a macular edema, there is fluid collection. Edema is actually fluid collection. Where? At the macula. This leads to the separation of the rods and cones from the retinal pigment epithelium. If they get separated, what happens to the distance factor? The sensory layer, which is a layer of rods and cones, come closer to the principal point. This leads to the clumping of the lines. The edges of the macular edema looks like a hill with a steep climb, an angle oblique. So what did we just say about the oblique screen? Right, stretch lines. This is caused from the cones being forced closer together, making the retinal image fall on more cones than normal. If this kind of a picture happens somewhere away from the macula, with the absence of the central pinch and all the lines stretched away, it can indicate a mass lesion. It appears like a net being stretched by a mass underneath. So the classically described Amsler's grid in case of macular edema is the one where there is a central clumping of the lines with peripheral stretching. It's not only about the deformed lines there may be absent areas. These signify scotomas. Now, scotomas appear to the patient in two forms. In case of a small scotoma, the brain, the occipital cortex, tries to complete the missing parts. So it gives an appearance which looks as if a region of the lines have been erased from the paper. In case where the scotomas are large and recent, the brain is yet to get accustomed to it or unlikely to get accustomed to it. They look to the patient as black absent areas. A very sharp observant patient can chart his own perimetry with an Amsler's grid. Now let's come to how the screening is done. Amsler's grid is a screening tool used by the patient. 
The classic Amsler's grid is supposed to be a small book of different charts. We will come to see these separate charts later. The Amsler's grid should be performed when a patient presents with a decreased visual acuity that is not improved with pinhole. Many times, the patient will have a chief complaint of distorted or strange visual symptoms. The commonly used ones today are tablet-style Amsler's grid that contains tear-off sheets that the patient can draw on and be placed separately along with their clinical notes and date. Note that somebody else cannot draw your Amsler's grid. It's a self-done task, no delegations. You now decide to give an Amsler's grid to a patient of yours. So you take a sheet of Amsler's grid and hand it over to the patient. For the time being, you are the patient and I will sell this Amsler's grid to you. You have been suspected to have macular edema and I have to keep you under my follow-up. So I give you this nice beautiful chart which looks like a graph paper. Or let's call it the Amsler's grid. This chart has a central black dot that measures the central 20 degrees of your vision. Each eye is tested separately in different charts. I expect you to screen yourself regularly with this and I will tell you how. First, you need to take a chart and write the date and eye you are going to test, right or left. Then wear your prescribed spectacles of near vision. By this I mean your reading glasses. No eye drops are to be used before this test and preferably done first thing in the morning. Now hold this chart at a regular reading distance. Some people prefer to hang this in their bathroom wall beside the face mirror to do this test before using their toothbrush. Test your right eye first. Close your left eye with your palm without pressing it. Now focus your right eye on the central black dot in the grid. Now you'll be able to see a lot of lines around it. Few lines are vertical and some are horizontal. Do you notice any wavy lines, any black spots, any discontinuity, pinched areas, swollen areas? If you are seeing any of them, try to draw them on the chart. Show this chart to your ophthalmologist and follow his guidelines. Keep these charts safely with your date and side indicated clearly as these charts will help us understand the progress or regress of your disease. Now let's come to the type of Amsler's grids. Amsler's grid is a printed chart where there are many small and big squares like the graph paper or the ECG tracing paper. Each square measures 5 mm and when the grids are held at 30 cm from the patient, each square subtends 1 degree on the retina. The Amsler's grid is very simple. It is available in charts of six grids as well as individual grids or tablets. Today, it is available in the form of computer applications which can be used on computer screens. The most common Amsler's grid today is white on black or black on white. In some cases, the black and white grid does not detect early and subtle defects. Colored grids can be used for various purposes. Red lines in a black background are useful for detecting photoreceptor abnormalities at an early stage, like toxic amblyopia. Red Amsler grid screening may allow practitioners to identify patients who are more likely to have hydroxychloroquine toxicity before they have any manifested visual dysfunction. These red line grids can detect optic nerve problems and chiasmal disorders earlier than the standard black and white types. These grids are also available in blue on yellow, blue on red and white on red background which are used for different sensitivity patterns. The beauty of these charts lie in their ease of use. We don't require an ophthalmologist to give away these charts or train the patients. Any abnormality is identified by the patient himself and can be asked to contact his treating ophthalmologist or physician as the case may be. So, Dr. Mark Amsler did make our life much more easier. Otherwise, we would be still hanging on to the old parameters with long patient queues. 
who are now sitting at their home quietly drawing their Amsler charts. There is another snippet in ophthalmology named after Dr. Mark Amsler. That is, Amsler's sign or also known as Amsler Vary sign. This is seen in Fuchs heterochromatic iridocyclitis and is diagnostic of this condition. Classically, the sign is described as the appearance of hyphema in the anterior chamber immediately after a patient undergoes applanation tonometry. The mechanics behind this finding is based on one fact, fragile capillaries. In Fuchs heterochromatic iridocyclitis or FHI, there is iris atrophy. This leads to exposure of the stromal capillaries, which are otherwise very delicate. Any change in pressure in the anterior chamber leads to stretch and shear of these capillaries and they bleed leading to hyphema. This can occur due to various causes. Applanation tonometry being the most common innocuous outpatient procedure, this can also happen in aspiration of vitreous fluid, anterior chamber paracentesis or even cataract surgery. Some patients bring up this hyphema after vigorous rubbing of the eye. So finally, we conclude. Dr. Amsler has contributed to the advancement of ophthalmology in a big way. We now come to the end of today's episode and are eager to find your names in such achievements in the future. We will be back with yet another interesting episode shortly. Till then, let us know your feedback and questions, if any, about this episode at offthecast at the rate gmail.com. Visit us at www.offthecast.com, our newly launched domain. We are also available on iTunes, SoundCloud and TuneIn. Just search for Off the Cast. Till then, goodbye, Godspeed and Merry Christmas.